welcome to Ephemera. I am fantasy author KT Brisky. And I am not on screen. And I am editor Jen R. Albert. We hope you're enjoying our theme music courtesy of Alex White, who's here with us tonight. Uh, welcome to anybody joining us for the first time and welcome back to those who have visited our virtual home before. For those who are new, Ephemera is an award nominated reading series chaired by Katie and myself. Pre-COVID, our events had their beginnings at the Glad Day Bookshop, and we are honored and grateful to be with you for their endings right here on YouTube. And we would like to begin tonight by acknowledging that the land on which I live and work is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. This land is covered under Treaty 13 and is part of the dish with one spoon. And the land on which I live and work is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas, and is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant. Additionally, this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase 1792 between uh, the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The funny thing about endings is that they often prompt us to reflect on beginnings, where we started, the journey we took to reach a particular conclusion. And in doing so, it's hard not to compare our beginnings and our ends. How different things are, how different we are, what we've learned, what we wish we'd known then. We started the series in 2019. In that year, Marion Buller, the Chief Commissioner for the National Inquiry into Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women and Girls, said that genocide of Indigenous peoples in Canada was, quote, an inescapable conclusion. A supplementary report said, quote, the Canadian state was founded on colonial genocidal policies that are inextricably linked to Canada's contemporary relationship with Indigenous peoples. Modern Canadian policies perpetuate these colonial legacies and have resulted in clear patterns of violence and marginalization of Indigenous peoples, particularly women, girls, and 2S LGBTQQIA, end quote. 2019 then saw much debate between settler politicians, media outlets, and social media about whether or not the atrocious systematic acts of violence and erasure perpetuated by the Canadian state constituted a genocide. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau preferred the term cultural genocide, while then conservative leader Andrew Scheer called it its own thing. This year in 2023, the Pope called the residential school system a genocide and the House of Commons gave unanimous consent for MP Leah G Gazan's motion calling on the federal government to recognize residential schools as genocide. So, not its own thing. There are a number of other stats and events I could list from 2019 and 2020, 2021, 2022, but honestly, I think twice before doing so. It's nearly 2024. We all know how deep the injustices run. In four years, part of my journey has been learning more about strengths-based resurgence, resurgence, Indigenous people's resilience, achievements, and vitality, as well as ensuring we keep the truth of traumas and inequities. I'm sure we've all grown and learned since Ephemera started, but I also wonder if, as individuals, we need to move beyond the comfort of still learning, if we've done the things that are easy or easier to do. Unlike this series, the work of reconciliation continues. I encourage you, I challenge you, in four more years, where can we get to? As individuals, as local communities, as nations. Every ending is also a beginning. Let tonight be the start of something better. Thank you. Well, here we are at the end of the road, the last chapter, a final devastating chord that will slowly die into silence unbroken. And also our birth birthday party. Francie is Happy birthday. more. <laughs> Happy birthday, Francie. I guess it's pretty on brand for Francie's birthday to also be his wake. HBD and RIP. Uh, but in all seriousness, we appreciate the outpouring of love and support for the series. You are what made what has made Ephemera such a great event for so long. So thank you. We've got lots planned for you tonight. 
Um, and we know that many of you are probably, probably feeling a lot as we are. Um, however, this is still ephemera, so we won't keep you from our first reader any longer. We're very prompt, always have been. Naben Rethnam's most recent works are a novel, uh, the novel Hero of Our Time and the horror novella Help Me, as well as the book he will read from tonight. He's written thrillers as Nathan Ripley and also writes for the screen. He lives in Toronto, Ontario. Naben? Hi. Uh, great to be reading to all of you. Thanks to Ephemera for having me. Um, I'm going to be reading from my new book, which is, you know, kind of for young readers, also kind of for everybody. Um, it's set in 1996 in Kelowna, and I'm reading from the eighth eighth chapter. The main character is a, a young South Asian kid growing up in Kelowna who's obsessed with books and heavy metal. You know, parts of it's all fiction, of course, because there's monsters in it and stuff. But uh, parts of it are, of course, borrowed from my own life. So I thought I'd also wear this Metallica shirt that I bought in 1996 at my first heavy metal concert. Um, it's very old now, but it's not actually really decent for public anymore. There's some holes, but you'll not see them on this. Chapter eight. Fish knew he wouldn't be able to sleep that night. An official new bedtime hadn't been discussed since he'd returned to home, but he didn't want to push it. So he usually went to his room and had the lights up by 10.30. Tonight, he waited until the noises in the kitchen above him stopped. The last reliable sounds of every evening were Angie filling a pint glass with water, Angie being his mother, and her slippered footsteps moving across the floor or Vish's bedroom ceiling toward the hallway and the master bedroom. It was exactly 11.32, according to the clock radio on the bedside table. Fish pulled the blankets off, stepped back into his jeans, and walked out into the darkened house, flicking on the TV in the downstairs den. He kept it quiet enough to be able to hear any sign of wakefulness from upstairs. He had every creaking board memorized and an escape plan from the den that would have the television off and him in bed in under 25 seconds. 30 if he took his jeans off before getting under the sheets. Fish wasn't really supposed to be watching the independent and foreign films on Channel 24's After Midnight Showcase review. He had almost forgotten about them when he was off at the boarding school where the television was shared property and everyone was in their own room by nine o'clock. But Fish had quickly come back to this weekend habit, not just for the viewer discretion as advised parts, but for the stories, the images, because even when the movies weren't good, they were unlike anything he'd seen before. And after what he'd seen and heard today, Fish wanted to see something that was unfamiliar, but not scary. Sitting on the maroon couch with the broken springs that his mother had exiled down here after buying a new living room suite at Leon's with part of her money from the first commission for a duplex sale, Fish kept the lights off. He knew the rubbery topography of the TV remote control by heart, could tell the volume from the channel control by the different wear on the buttons. His thumb smashed mute whenever he heard a creak from upstairs and hovered over power until he was sure there was no sound. The movie tonight was apparently about a musician named Veronique who had two lives, but Fish had missed the first 10 minutes and was worried he'd never understand it. But the colors were beautiful, and what he could hear of the music was too. There were a few bad memories that Fish had tried to bury of his father coming home at about this time of night, fumbling his keys, sitting down heavily to take his shoes off, canning, can canoning them into the hall closet. Like his mother had, Fish pretended he didn't hear his dad's stumbling entrances. They came when Manish, his father, was pairing up the pills with drinking at the bar and took a cab home, leaving his own car at the office. And on those evenings, Fish simply turned off the television and did a silent carpeted run into the corner of the downstairs rec room, a dark patch where he could see his father sitting heavily on the chair in the entryway. And more importantly, where he could see him stand up and walk off to sleep, whether that was in his own bed or on the guest room cot. Vish had to believe that this would never happen again, and mostly he did. He got up from his comfortable nest in the old couch to pull a sealed pack of after eights from behind a loose brick behind the never-used fireplace in the corner of the room and settled down with the chocolates. He'd put the box there on spring break last year, thinking it was a bit childish to keep using this old hiding spot for no reason, but doing it anyway. They would have to be finished off tonight now that the box was unsealed or there was a risk of attracting ants. Really, it was his duty to finish what he started, so Vish put the first two mints into his mouth at the same time. 
Behind the television was the great bay window that looked out onto the Moria's backyard, which was overseen by a tall maple tree and backed by a line of tall shrubs that had their heads trimmed off every May, so there would be a view of the lake from the upstairs balcony. Dr. Moria used to hire a gardener to do it, but eventually invested in a tall folding ladder and a gas-powered trimmer and did an uneven job of it himself. Fish never got to use the trimmer, which looked like a junior chainsaw with bigger, goofier teeth. But he did have to hold the ladder while his dad was up there. The woman on screen fainted while she was singing something operatic that Fish realized he hadn't been listening to, because he was watching something move outside, below the maple tree. The branches of the tree started up about six feet up from its base and expanded to cover almost half of the yard. In the daytime, the shadow was huge and cool. At night, it was a place of deeper darkness. The moonlight that made the leaves above this patch glisten couldn't penetrate beyond them. There was something even darker in the blackness, something that hunched, that moved very quickly, that seemed to turn a very white face toward the window Fish was staring out of. Fish hit the power button on the remote and the room went dark. The dead springs in the couch creaked as he leaned forward. His eyes got used to the absence of light and he moved closer to the sliding patio door that was next to the bay window. It was a glass door with a simple lock Fish thought he was checking just to make sure that it was in the right position. It was, but Fish found himself pushing it down unlocking the door. He slid it open, just enough to fit through sideways. There were crickets and the sound of someone swimming in the Ackroyd's pool six houses over. Just one person paddling around, probably their son Mikey, who was back from college in Washington. Mikey, tall and pale with an Adam's apple that was truly as big as a crab apple. He'd stopped calling himself Mikey years ago, going for Mike instead. But when he was Mikey, he was also the newspaper delivery boy who had taught fish to ride his bike. They always waved at each other, but they hadn't talked for a few years. Fish could hear each splash and stroke because the night was so quiet. He stepped out on the cool, pale cement just outside the patio door, leaving it open, even though mosquitoes might make their way inside. He didn't know if it was bravery that was making him come out here, but he did know that he wouldn't be able to stand taking another step if that door was closed behind him. Mikey swam regular laps when he was home, and those made a very clear sound. Nothing like what Fish had heard since he'd opened the door. What he could hear was a gentle slurping, as though someone was trying to get out of the pool, as slowly and quietly as possible. Fish started work walking toward the maple tree. He stared at the small, fat hump at its base that was new. Fish would have thought it was a little heap of earth if he hadn't seen it move when he was inside. The crickets didn't go quiet all at once, and maybe Mike Ackroyd just got tired of swimming at around the same time as the bugs settled down. But by the time Fish stepped off the cement and his bare feet touched the springing green of the wet grass and the crisp yellow of one of the patches that the sprinklers never caught, there was no sound in the air except the air itself. Fish is breathing. And quietly from that hump by the roots of the tree, a sound somewhere between breathing and the puffing a kettle makes just before it whistles. Fish's toenail touched a rock. He would have stubbed the toe badly if he'd been walking at his normal pace. He was barely five feet away from the patio, and it had been almost a full minute since he'd walked outside. Fish knelt and picked up the rock. It was smooth and heavy. It fit his palm. On a beach, he would have tried to skip it across the water. It was dark gray or black in the moonlight, with little lines of mica that glistened when he moved his hand. Fish wasn't moving it on purpose. It was shaking. He looked again at the hump and stopped his breathing to see if he could hear it. But the thing had stopped breathing as well. It was moving. What seemed at first to be an arm unfolded from the cluster of dark, except it kept folding out, getting longer until Vish was sure it was a leg. But then it seemed even longer than that, and it began to rise into the air, until the end of it wrapped around one of the lowest branches of the tree. The white face that Vish was sure he'd seen within the quivering black mound began to turn towards him. Vish knew that if it smiled at him, he wouldn't be able to stop screaming. Below the turning face, the figure was only one arm and one leg, with the darkness between the two. Ferris. Ferris's ghost limbs taking shape stealing solidity from the trees around them, perhaps from Vish himself. If Fair stored people by making deals and eating them, perhaps he could nibble and bite on living folk who'd made no deal. Mosquitoes and blackflies did it, taking blood and skin that wasn't there. Why not this man? Feeling a coldness at his back, Fish turned around, and there he saw the other parts of the dark shadow that was under the tree, half green, black, and dripping the Ackroyd's pool water on the light cement of his patio. The missing arm and leg, the ragged torso, all walking toward Vish as the other half of the body approached from the tree. Something else forming above that scrappy torso began to smile at Vish. Vish wheeled around and threw the rock at the only thing he could see clearly in the darkness. He was bad at throwing balls in any sport, but apparently good at throwing rocks. 
The corner of the white face that was coming toward him was hit squarely, and the breathing hiss started again. The green blackness behind Vish rushed to join the other half of its body, which was retreating back toward the maple. The hissing stopped altogether as both long arms, lengthening into handless tentacles, tightened around the tree branch and pulled the bound of dark matter up into the air, swinging it over the fence into the next yard. Fish heard a lolloping thump and rise, the sound of a sticky limb gripping branches and eaves troughs and window panes in yards farther and farther away, until he could hear nothing at all. But while he listened to all of this, he watched something that was drifting like a leaf, down from the upper reaches of the trees where the creature's first swing had launched it. The whiteness fluttered into the grass just in front of him. It looked like a mask, but it wasn't made of rubber or latex. It was paper. Fish knew that if he touched it, it would be rich and thick, like the expensive stuff at the stationery store in the mall, but with even more texture. There was a hole where the mouth should be, a torn gap that went up at one end and down at the other. In profile, it could smile or frown when whatever was wearing it turned it aside. There were holes to the eyes as well, but they weren't holes just now. As Vish moved back and around the mask, Letting more moonlight hit it, he saw what was in the holes. In a way, it made perfect sense. It was a pair of eyes, real pale blue eyes without eyelids, staring up stupidly. Vish opened his mouth to scream, and as he did, the eyes vanished, either melting into the grass or evaporating into the air. Before the mask blew away in a wind that hadn't been there a moment before, Vish saw that the mask also had eyebrows, thin black eyebrows, the thinnest eyebrows Vish had ever seen. Thank you so much for sharing that. That scene always creeps me out. Uh, there's a lot of gross out uh, sort of horror and stuff in this book as well. It's excellent. I'm not just saying that because I edited it, but I did. Thank you so much, Nubin. Thank you. Uh, and just the like perfectly placed and chosen details. I was saying in the chat, I've never been so unnerved by the word slurping, <laughs> but it was so perfect. Um, yeah. And just like, the eyebrows for some reason like oh man that detail just like went into my core great thank you i appreciate thank that you. all right so at a birthday and at a wake one of the things that we often do is we tell stories um we also sometimes lose our scripts and then we ad lib um so we'd like to share some of the stories of people behind the scenes who have helped bring ephemera to life uh, KT is much better at ad-libbing than I am. <laughs> uh, so we've had a lot of help uh, bringing this to all of you for all of these years. And one unsung hero is Jessica Albert, art director at ECW Press, who uh, designed all of our visual elements, all the stuff on the website, all of the banners um, that you see in the show, um, including transforming a Victorian anatomical illustration of a deer into our beloved Prancy. Um, I remember receiving the concept out from her years ago, back in 2019 um, in the summer. Uh, and there was a man in a hot air balloon, um, a really gorgeous ephemeral looking lady, and of course the skeleton deer. Um, and it's not just any skeleton deer. It's a dancy and prancy deer that we know and love. And thus the legend was born. Uh, as for me, I think back to the upheaval of 2020, uh, a few months after we had taken Ephemera online, I was chatting with uh, my good friend Alex White, and our conversation turned towards Ephemera and the challenges and joys of hosting an online reading series. And an astoundingly short time later, they sent me some music they'd written for Ephemera, and it was so generous and so unexpected and so absolutely perfect for the series. Um, I, I have been thrilled every time I've heard it. I think it will live in my heart forever. It's very, very needed at the beginning. We just, we needed that and we didn't even know we did. So thank you, Alex. Um, and now audience, it is your turn. What stories do you have about Ephemera and your time with Prancy and us? Um, share them in the chat. And while you do that, it is my very great privilege to welcome Ephemera's official musician, Alex White, here to sing our skeleton dear friend to sleep. <laughs> Alex uh... White. Oh. I was going to read your bio if you would oh, like. Sorry. You get the full no, introduction. No, no, no. Yes, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Alex White was born in Mississippi and has lived most of their life in the American South. Alex is the author of the Star Metal Symphony Trilogy and the Salvagers Trilogy, as well as official novels for Alien, The Cold Forge, and, and Into Charybdis, and Star Trek, DS9 Revenant. They enjoy music composition, 
calligraphy, and challenging subversive fiction, all of which they do extraordinarily well. Uh, and of course, they also wrote the wonderful theme music that we have enjoyed every month. Thank you so much for being here, Alex. It is my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I uh, so so I guess I should just get started with a little bit of music for y'all. Uh, so the this song comes from my current novel series, The Star Metal Symphony. It starts with August Kitko and the Mechas from Space. Let's just say that the two love interests of this series are going to be separated at some point for a length of time. Oh, no. And um, so this song is one of the songs that uh, one of the characters wrote. They're both musicians. One's a glam rocker. The other's a sad jazz boy. You'll love them. Check the book out. I forgot about us Don't believe that it's true Cause etched on my mind Is all of the time I've spent with you Though our years have long passed We could never be through it's a surprise to look in your eyes and not say I love you. This old feeling has got me reeling and I know that it's wrong and I know I've moved on but then I see you look at me and I think, please grant me this. I can't believe I forgot about us. I forgot about us. When you touched me, I remembered my trust, I remembered my trust. And I hope to find the other side of all the things that I have tried and failed to put into my life to wash your taste away. And who am I to deny the lonely pleasures of a life unsatisfied Ever since the day you walked away So please just grant me this The quiet of one more perfect kiss And I swear it's the last time I swear it's the last time so give yourself to me, and we can share this memory, and I swear it's the last time, I swear it's the last time, cause I'm dying for you to know that I'm putting on a show for the others, for the others tonight, and if we were alone, then maybe I Tone for the loss of your love in my life So please grant me this So please just grant me this The quiet of one I swear it's the last time So give yourself to me And we can share this memory And I swear it's the last time I swear it's the last time Cause I'm dying for you to know That I'm putting on a show For the others, for the others tonight and if we were involved, then maybe I'd atone for the loss of the love in my life. So please.
please grant me this I swear it's the last time I swear it's the last time I swear it's the last time I swear Thank you. It's it's weird not having any direct interaction with the audience. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to uh, play another song for you. This one is called House of Locks. Can you see her? Have you seen my diamond shining? Throughout the night, I hear she makes such clever, wondrous things that they might come alive in your arms. She lives alone within a castle, a haunted house she can't leave behind. She walks and walks and walks its hallways Searching for something she won't find So she dwells there yet she dreams of freedom Something that I would gladly give She builds around her is how she has come to live within a house of locks oh 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 within a house of locks oh 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 within a house of locks oh 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 within a house of locks oh Walls are closing in and she can't stay here But there's no place to go It seems this cold and ever faithless world Has never held a promise for her She knows, she knows the secret lovely hollow chambers of a broken heart she knows she knows her spirit wonders to something not yet written in the stars so she dwells there yet she dreams of freedom Tending to the passages of time I watch the windows Hope to see her Though her eyes will never meet mine No Within the house of logs, oh, 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 within the house of logs, oh, 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 within the house of logs, oh, 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 within the house of logs, oh, 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 within the house of logs, oh, 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 within the house of logs, oh, 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 within the house of logs, oh, 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 within the house of logs,
Smith in the house of Lot. Oh, 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 oh. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Oh, just the range in those two songs, both vocally, artistically. Um, I made a bet with myself that I would like end up crying by the end, and I won my bet with oh, myself. Good. Good. Or lost. I, I'm, I'm I think happy I won. That I'm always happy to make you cry. That's uh, you know, as a writer, there's no greater compliment. You can make people laugh by accident all the time. No, it's so true. Thank you so much for that. Of course, yeah. of course. And I've got more for you for before the evening is out. Well, I think that's foreshadowing, which may be foreshadowing a joke that's about to come in the script, actually. We're oh, very wow. meta. <laughs> no, we're so on brand. We're a very meta series. But I am curious to hear about some of the stories that the audience has related and remembered and reflected on um, yes. with each other. Um, the introduction of Kevin Kelp, the canonical jerk friend of ours. <laughs> Um, Kat Gordon, uh, when she came and joined us and Claire, when Claire and Susan Palomo came and joined us several, I think our second show four years ago. Yes. In person. Yes. yes. That was a, that was a fun one. Uh, it has certainly been a busy four years. Um, Prancy has been up to a lot with his various, fr various friends, like the aforementioned jerk friend, Kevin Kelp, uh, the swamp, Witch, Plantington, the third, the space whale, <laughs> it's hard to believe four, year, four years ago we held our very first event the event before Claire's in the Gladly bookshop it was cold unlike today November so much was happening COVID did not exist yet or at least we didn't know about it um and we didn't really know what we had gotten ourselves into with this series but what a party it was uh there were drag performances there were three incredible readers uh Kelly Robson Madeline Ashby and Rati Marotra there were cauliflower bites, and there was our theme, beginnings. I think we always knew that the last ephemera, whenever it came, would be endings. In fiction, we call that foreshadowing. Uh -huh. <laughs> Which would have also been a good theme. <laughs> we mostly developed our themes by saying words at each other uh, until one stuck. Uh, we generally tried to make them open to hope and kindness and better worlds, also just like interpretable in many different ways. Um, and when we could manage, ma uh, manage it as well, seasonally appropriate. <laughs> At least somewhat. Um, with 48 themes over four years, I'm not sure I remember all of them, but I was pretty proud of Penumbra's. And I still think that bring your own theme was funny. If I was thinking of my favorite themes, that's definitely up there. Um, Frisons, fr frison, frisions, uh, I like that one because no one could pronounce it. That was fun. <laughs> and a recent one, Contradictions, uh, because I'm made of them. Uh, how about you, audience? Four years of ephemera. Do you remember any themes that stood out to you? Bend and while you head. share with each other, it is my great pleasure to introduce our next reader. Ariel Lee is a writer of soft sci-fi stories with a literary commercial edge. She loves the feeling of when an emotionally resonant passage bridges the gap between author and audience, making you feel seen. Oh, I love that. Ariel is a 2022 Right Hive mentee and is working on her first novel. Born in Hong Kong and raised in Canada, she now resides in Ottawa and can be found on Blue Sky at Ariel Exists, as well as on her website at arielexists.com. Welcome, Ariel. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much to Jen and Katie for inviting me to read. And thank you to my fellow readers and everyone here tonight. 
it's an honor to be part of such an incredible series. I'm blown away by everyone who came before me, and uh, I just hope I can live up to it. So I will briefly mention that I'm currently in Ottawa. I want to acknowledge that it's unceded, unsurrendered Anishinaabe Algonquin territory. So today, I'm reading the opening of a work in progress, a short story that I wrote while taking a break from my novel. Um, content warning, there will be mentions of death and dying. Since this is a short story, uh, since this is a short about someone's last day on Earth, it seemed fitting for this evening's theme. I hope you enjoy. <clears throat> Prue didn't want to believe it was the end. She didn't want to believe it when the power outages crawled across the city like an enormous electric field warping serpent. It started sinking in when the airport shut down after pilots forgot their training and when her neighbor spent five hours talking to his Yorkie as if it were his mother, sporadically shouting, You don't understand me! But Prue fully believed it when, in the twilight of the final evening, her dead ex-best friend knocked on her front door. Tess? Prue said with a frown. How are you here? That's silly, Tess replied as if Prue had told a funny joke. Haven't you heard? There's an asteroid coming. Something about a highly unusual magnetic field? Of course, Prue had heard. For months, the guest astrophysicists had pronounced it like a clairvoyant on the radio. Before the Earth-bound asteroid brings on the end of days, they'd said. It will dredge up long-forgotten memories, muddle minds so they'll unlearn, and cause the last hours of humanity to proceed that much stranger. Prue was not taking it well, but Tess sure seemed put together. Sure, the asteroid explained how Tess was there. Now, Prue said, why are you here? Tess ignored the question and, like a curious child, went on tiptoe to peer over Prue's shoulder. So, got anything exciting planned? Tess said. A soundtrack of laughter interrupted from the television in the living room. You have company? She sounded irritatingly hopeful. No, Prue said firmly, though the question had thrown her off kilter even more than she already was. If you must know, I was looking forward to spending my final hours watching comfort shows and guzzling as many party-sized chip bags as possible in the sanctuary of my own home. Who thought overdosing on childhood nostalgia was not the worst way to go, and had decided on that fate, but leave it to Tess, after being dead for three years, to make her doubt herself. Oh, okay. For a moment, Tess looked around like she was lost. Then her expression changed into something coy and expectant, one designed to make Prue forget the last few years of being quiet and alone, hinting at their younger selves, fun and rebellious trouble. Hey, Tess said, I have an idea. Hear me out? I'm not so sure about that, Prue replied. Tess bit her lip. Look, I know that right before I, well... She swept her fingers like a blade across her throat and left out her tongue in a caricature of untimely demise. I know I left things in tatter between us, but maybe we could talk it out. Tess offered up her palms, a magnag a magnag sorry, a magnanimous gesture, and burned those bridges. Who furled her brows in pain and contemplation. They'd grown up together. In the later years, particularly around the time of Tess's 30th, things soured between them. They had already stopped talking by the time the lake had cut everything short between them. Prue had come to terms with every emotion that had battered her after Tess passed. Sadness. Anger. Guilt. But Tess was someone Prue had never truly let go of, and she often wondered what might have happened if Tess were still around, and whether, given time, their friendship would have mended. Well, somehow, Tess was around now. In some ways, the end of the world felt like a fresh start. There was no threat like death to strip away all pretenses. Fine, Prue eked open her door. Great. As Tess bounded inside, Prue noted the tree in her front yard. It, would, it was twisting its branches, crossing its fingers as if to say good luck. Prue would need it. She took a deep breath and followed her ex-best friend inside. So there's an end of humanity party happening tonight, and we should go, Tess already said before Prue could fully sit down. 
What happened to talking things out, Prue replied, her stomach flipping like a roller coaster. She attributed the queasiness to the strangeness of having her ghost friend present and tried to alleviate it by curling on the sofa and pressing a throw blanket against her stomach. I forgot how much you resisted everything, Tess sighed and plopped down on the floor. She found a stack of dominoes and began building a precarious row on the coffee table. She never could sit still. It's an end of the world party. Don't you want to experience something amazing? And I'm back from the dead one night only. Who had been wondering about that? So, what was it like being... Dead? said Tess. Oh, it was just like someone turned an off switch. I don't remember anything from it. But being alive again, it's incredible. I'm noticing all sorts of things I couldn't before. If I plant my bare feet on the ground, I can feel the earth move. If I focus, I can see all the currents flowing through the air and everything looks like a Van Gogh. And I'm sort of an antenna now? Tess waved her hands like a magician through the air. I can hear radio signals. That's how I heard about the party. And look at this. Tess leaned over the dominoes on the coffee table and nudged the first in the row. Instead of falling, it grew tiny legs and arms, then shuffled forward and tapped the pieces before it, causing them to squeal and run around in rapture. See, she said, and I have a feeling that things will go even faster and higher and better. We'll see it all together. When Tess finished, Prue wanted to shake her for it. Before Tess came along, Prue had come to terms with dying, laid out her most treasured possessions for company, and had come to terms with dying alone. Then Tess made her see how much was possible, and now Prue was questioning it all over again. The end came for all of us, but they still had twelve brilliant hours, and hidden in those hours was a feeling Prue didn't know she'd missed, a feeling that the world was wide open. It was enough to remind her why they became friends in the first place. Once upon a time, when Prue had just moved into town, Tess was the only friendly face in a strange new place, someone who included her when no one else did, opened up the world for her. Unlike the end of the world, Prue hadn't accepted that the end of her and Tess's friendship was inevitable, so she stood up. Let's do it, she said. Yes, Tess bounded forward. Just promise, Prue added, that before the night ends, we can come back home. And at that moment, the world shook. Tremors rattled through Prue's body. Her queasiness returned in full force. Before Prue could grasp what was happening, the world swept her mind to another time and place. And um, I'm going to stop there. Thank you for listening. Um, and I'm crying again. Um, I thought that was like such an interesting way to look at endings and loss, like the the ending and loss of a friendship, of a single life, of all of the world and humanity. I would also be very much here for an end of humanity party. Um, and Ariel, you actually, your story summoned my cat. <laughs> Yay. Hello, Guinness. <laughs> and there's many themes Thank you so much, Ariel. That was wonderful. Um, many themes being shared, refuge, uh, dread, humor, community, I think our ultimate theme or one of them for sure. <laughs> um, I also got a text in that was the accidental theme when everyone was from Ottawa. Oh yeah, the Ottawa theme. <laughs> yeah, not an official theme, but it ended up that, I think that was December, 2021. All of our readers and um, our main music uh, musician were from Ottawa. All, all four of them. We heart Ottawa. Night. Uh, uh, that's amazing. It uh, is. And you, What's you also know. amazing is when you consider we've had four artists per month, 12 months per year. For four years, we've hosted around 200 artists on Ephemera, which is such a privilege. Like, what, what an absolute privilege to have so many amazing people come through our little virtual space. It's true. Sometimes we've been a person's first reading ever. It's such a deep honor for us. And we've heard unpublished work, previews of things that were published later on and classic well-loved stories as well, of books that people were already in love with. Um, since going virtual, we've had writers during the show from every continent, I think, except Antarctica. <laughs> that would be <laughs> quite a get. Uh, and both Katie and I penguin have gotten- Penguin Core. <laughs> yeah, Penguin Core. 
<laughs> it's the next big thing. Uh, and we've met authors who are we are very big fans of, honestly. <laughs> Get to sort of like nerd out. Personal, like, fan person moments, um, which has meant a lot. But as a last question, before the last reader of the last ephemera, what has all this meant to you? Jump in the chat one last time. And now we welcome our final reader, final, final. Uh, Zalika Reed Benta is a Toronto based writer whose first novel, River Mama, debuted in August 2023 uh, and has been uh, the October 2023 pick for City Line Book Club, named one of the best books of fall 2023 by The Walrus, and has been a bestseller on the BookNet Indie Booksellers list. Her debut short story collection, Fla Frank Planton, won the Denuda Gleed Literary Award, the Radican Kobo Emerging Writer Prize, the Lit for Literary Fiction. Um, it was also long listed for the Scotiabank Giller Prize, short listed for the Toronto Book Award, um, the White Pine Award, and the Trill Trillium Book Award. Azalika served as the 2021 to 2022 Writer in Residence at Western University and was the chair of the 2021 Scotiabank Giller Prize. Welcome. I was like there and then I disappeared. Um, hi everyone, thank you for uh, in, in inviting me. It's been a pleasure to hear everyone else before the read, readers and um, Alex, actually your music summoned both of my cats. They came out of the room and they were looking around like, what is this voice? It was it was really fun. Um, and um, it's just been so great hearing everybody speak. Um, so I am reading from River Mama. I'm reading from the seventh chapter. The um, the uh, plot of this book is that a uh, Jamaican deity, River Mama, has come to Toronto and has um, told my main character, Alicia, that she has 24 hours to find her comb, even though Alicia doesn't know anything about this comb or who had taken it. And um, in this chapter, she's being chased by uh, ghosts she and her friend uh, by Jamaican ghosts. And so this is, this is how it goes. Alicia didn't know where she was. On Weston, she passed the blue and white automotive center and just ahead there'd been a Tim Hortons and a Petro Canada gas station. But now she was running on a residential crescent turning down a second side street and she lost her bearings. The cold shredded her lungs, but she was sweating through her hoodie. Heat seemed to chase her like a sentient predator working its way into her body and made her nauseous. On her left, a rusted chain link fence spanned the length of the sidewalk. Alicia saw an opening and ran into what a Toronto Parks Department sign called York Stadium Park. There was nothing inside of the fence but snow covered grass. It was probably used as a soccer field in warmer months and clusters of leafless trees along the perimeter. Behind it in the distance were brown brick apartments and a modern looking gray building. It wasn't until Alicia stopped running, putting her hands on her knees to catch her breath and looking up to the steadily brightening sky that she heard her name being called. Are you related to Shelly Ann Fraser Price or some shit? Heaven and Mars weren't too far away. Mars held out Alicia's scarf as he approached. She wrapped it back around her neck in a sloppy twirl. What the hell is going on? I saw something last night, said Alicia, her words rapid fire, something that didn't make sense, but I'm starting to think it was real. And what I saw, it made me go into the river and I was drowning. And then I was in this next river and there was a veil and I was about to die again. And then two twos, I'm in my room and it's this morning. So none of that makes sense, said Heaven. Slow down, start again. Alicia shook her head. She could do an entire presentation and it would still sound like nonsense. I told you, I fell into the river behind my building, right? I didn't fall. I was pulled. It pulled me in and kept me under until it transported me to this place where I saw my ancestors. That happens when they try to warn you. You experience an ancestral dream, said Heaven, surprised. But it wasn't a dream. It was a visit. I was there. Heaven shook her head. That's not possible. I'm telling you, I think they gave me visions or gave me back my visions or my sight or whatever because I've been seeing some shit this morning and I just wanted to stop. But I don't think it'll stop until I find this comb. And if I don't find this Ross Clark comb, Alicia thought back to the vision within her vision, the rivers of dust and pebbles and boulders because the water in every stream, every pond, every creek that once belonged to River Mama had dried up. I just need to get this comb. What does a comb have to do with this? said asked Heaven. Alicia couldn't respond because the noise had returned, but now Mars and Heaven heard the clanging too. Heaven clutched her chest and Mars bent down low like he was expecting something to fall from the sky. What? It sprung out of the trees. At first it looked as if a shadow had become animate and leapt in the middle of the park. 
Then Alicia realized that there was a form to the shadow. It was a bull, except it was monstrously large, the size of a small house, its hide black with an inky texture. Coiled around its neck was an enormous metal chain that dragged behind its body. It had no eyes, rather fire flamed out of its sockets. It was living terror. It was a rolling calf, legitimately. Fuck, sighed heaven whispered. There was an overall malice to the spirit, and it radiated an ill will that bored into Alicia with an intensity she felt only once before. Yet when she'd been looking at the white man in the tableau, she was the one simmering with hatred, not the one receiving it. There was no time to think. Run! She and Mars took off at the same time, but when Alicia looked back, she saw Heaven hadn't moved at all. Heaven, come on, let's go. She still didn't move. Alicia could see on her face. Alicia could see on her face that she wanted to, but simply couldn't. She ran back for her as the bull charged toward them, the jangling of the chain making her squeeze her eyes shut against the noise. She snatched Heaven's hood, dragging her as she ran forward. As if yanked out of a trance, Heaven started moving on her own alongside Alicia. She tried to speak, but couldn't form a full sentence. Alicia yelled so Mars could hear her. We have to get out of the park. The information she just read was still fresh in her mind. There's a Catholic school across the street. So what? Duffies don't like crosses. That's vampires. Alicia yelled exasperated. Vampires don't have a monopoly on crosses, Mars. The sky continued to brighten slowly, readying itself for the impending sunrise, and the fence grew closer and closer. A dreadful wail pierced the air, and it struck Alicia with the terror that tightened her insides. She glanced a chance. She chanced to glance behind her. The rolling calf was galloping, but its hooves never seemed to touch the grass. The duppy reared its head. Alicia knew what was about to happen, and she yelled, more strangled cry than a word of caution. The duppy grunted, hard and long, and a jet of fire shot out of its nose. Get down! Mars drove to the ground, but heaven turned around. Alicia grabbed her, tackling her onto the ground. The fiery stream blazed over both of their bodies. Heaven put her hand to her mouth to muffle her screams, and then started cussing when she removed it. Nothing. I read nothing. I've heard nothing that said a rolling cap could fucking shoot fire. This isn't right. She started getting frantic. Nothing prepares you for this. Something isn't right. She disentangled herself from Alicia and started getting up again. Alicia grabbed Heaven's ankle, tucking her hard so that she fell back to the ground, barely escaping another surge of fire. No, I need to get out of here. Heaven scrambled to her feet and began running. Heaven! Alicia started to get up to follow her, but then flattened herself when the duppy blew out another surge of fire, singeing the tops of her braided buns. The intensity of the heat made her cry out. Raising her head slightly, she saw Mars leap out of the way. Alicia rolled sideways out of the line of fire, grasping, gasping as bits of snow slid beneath her coat, under her hoodie, and into her jeggings. Her buns unraveled and her braids whipped across her face. She tried to stand up, but she slipped on the ice. She flipped over on her back to see the rolling calf charging toward her and went rigid. No memories flooded her mind, no last wishes. She couldn't think of anything except that she was going to die unsatisfied and lost. She watched, transfixed in muted horror, as the rolling calf neared her. Alicia was jolted out of her morbid reverie. Hands roughly grabbed her by the arms, pulling her up to her feet and pushing her so that she tripped forward. Alicia turned her stumble into a run and looked to her right. Mars kept stride with her, the anger in his expression outmatched only by the fear in his eyes. How are you going to make heaven run and you're just straight sitting there? We could have booked it from time. The distance between them and the rolling calf had shortened. She could hear its gnashing teeth and crackling fire. The clink, clink, clink of its chain seemed to reverberate through it within the confines of Alicia's mind, and from the way Mars kept shaking his head, she was sure he shared in her suffering. She felt the sinister heat pass through her body, as if she couldn't help but draw it into herself. For a moment, she felt ill, and then dead, like a corpse or a shell with nothing inside. Mars looked at her, his eyes vacant, before a flicker of life returned to them. Alicia screamed out to heaven, who had made it across the street, leaning against the fence that bordered the Catholic school. What do we do? But heaven couldn't answer. She was clutching her chest, doubling over with the effort of trying to breathe. Alicia had never seen her so uncomposed. The duppy cried out once more, and Alicia's stomach dropped. A new warmth brought on by panic overtook her. She racked her brain for the stories Winston had told her, the flippant warnings she had dismissed. Quickly, she took off her scarf, dropping it on the ground. Looking behind her, she saw that the duppy had slowed down and then halted on in front of it. Start into your pocket, she said. Whatever you have in your wallet, anything. When Mars looked at her doubtfully, Alicia unzipped her whistlet. On God, it'll help. She dropped her lip gloss as she fled. Mars dug into his pocket for his wallet, opened it, and dropped a packaged condom, and then another. Alicia discarded her library card, threw away a couple of mini arrow bar wrappers. She took out her pocket pack of Advil and scattered a few pills before letting go of the little bottle. Mars released a few receipts, but then yelled, there were two fifties in there. 
Alicia saw him start to turn and she grabbed his wrist to keep him on track. You want to go back and get murked? Okay, it's not like sick bills, but a hundred dollars means shit if you're dead, Mars. He cursed loudly, craning his neck to see behind him. It's not following us. It's just standing there. Deputies have to count wherever you put in front of them, Alicia said. They made it out of the park and continued running across the street to the Catholic school where they found heaven in tears and repeatedly apologizing. I'm sorry, I couldn't think, she said. Alicia moved over to the fence and held on to it winded. It's fine. I never blank on an exam. I don't get stage fright, but I just, I couldn't think. It's fine, she said again firmly, almost like a snap, it's over. Alicia was too exhausted to listen to my heaven work herself up into an emotional crisis. Mars and I gave it some stuff to count. The sun will be up by the time it finishes and Duppy sleep in the day. We're good. It's all good. Just done it. Alicia sagged against the fence next to Mars, who was rubbing his head. She felt the pangs of her headache more intensely than before, though the pain was different now, a kind of swelling that made her head feel hot and slightly dizzy. Okay, I have a question. Mars stood up straight. What the fuck is wrong with you two? Alicia and Heaven blinked in surprise. They didn't get a chance to respond before Mars continued. You two were legit just going to die. Heaven, fine, you froze. That's a physical response you can't control. I'm going to let that ride. But Alicia, he turned to her. You fall down once and you, he started coughing, beating his chest with his fist. And you just stay down, my guy? Are you serious? Alicia's shock momentarily dulled throbbing in her temple. She'd never seen Mars this upset. In the six months she'd known him, she had never fully seen Mars phased by anything. Even when customers swore at him for rejecting expired coupons or berated him for slowly moving line at the cash, at the cash register, Alicia had never reacted to entitled customers out of sheer apathy for the job, but Mars just was good-natured. I didn't wake up to watch two people die today. That's so fucking selfish. Alicia moved away from the fence and looked from Mars to heaven and back again. She was going to apologize and tell them to leave, to run, to save themselves from the trouble of her responsibilities. Alicia looked directly at both heaven and Mars, her face set with purpose and intent, parted her lips, and then vomited on heaven's fur trimmed beauties. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. That was so untorn because I love the description and the action, like I can see it unfolding so clearly, which is exactly why I also want the televised mini miniseries. Like that dialogue just snaps. It's so <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. Uh, wow, well, um, and what a, a fitting final, final note to end on. What, what has the audience said about their time with Ephemera? Um, so Ephemera has been a safe place to be nerdy together and discover really cool writers, uh, a wonderful community space, a strong example of what a reading series can be, readings, yes, but other kinds of art as well, including our music, um, uh, I've, to I've our Switch one. Online as well. Oh, you got one? I've got one. Joy, community, imagination, friendship. It's lovely. Yeah. Um, well. <laughs> well. Happy birthday, Francie. Uh, we are very proud of our four-year run. At our very first event, we said that ephemera, paper artifacts, um, are those things that were not meant to survive, but did. Uh, this ephemera is like that too. We are not only, we not only survived, but we thrived in these four years. Uh, and while we are laying these dear bones to rest, we hope that the community and its spirit continues on. In the last four years, we've seen that hope, kindness, and diversity are absolutely essential. We need to look out for each other, to challenge ourselves in the world to do better, and to show up ready to do our part. We started Ephemera because we wanted a series like this, but it didn't exist. Uh, and we hope that someone does take up that in, a fu in the future. Um, and hey, if you wanna ask questions or bounce any ideas, off of us so you could always reach out we have some experience under our belts now <laughs> and believe in paying it forward um you know honestly thanks isn't enough to cover the last four years um but we'll offer it anyway ephemera truly is all of you uh we wish we were all in the same room to celebrate all we've made together by being together uh but as it is i'd like to raise this glass um a glass of water and a skull uh to prancy to prancy Ooh, and that's scowl. the show, except for some uh, music that will play us out. I'm very excited. Um, you can relive memories uh, with us on YouTube always, return to the fun, um, and just enjoy our archive. Um, we'd like to thank the Ontario Arts Council, as always, for their funding assistance, as well as the Toronto Arts Council and the Science Fiction Writers, Science Fiction Writers of America, who also fund us in the past. <laughs>
As we close out this series, we would like to thank tonight's fabulous readers, our composer, Alex White, our friends, families, loved ones, and you. Thank you for staying with us for four wonderful years. Sleep well, little dear. Good night. Good night. And now Alex is going to play. When the stories wind down, the voice is not so loud. The party's over, empty drinks like ghosts haunt the grounds. The dawn will come, another sun will grace the skies, and I don't know what I'll do when I'm alone. And I'm wondering how many more of these we get before they're gone And they're just the times we have And I'm thinking how every time we part the distance grows But it won't be that bad If you would just stay just a little bit longer, hey I knew this couldn't last forever But you know that I'm not ready Stay just a little bit longer Hey, hey I really thought that we could have this apart we don't have the time we don't have the heart I know I walked away I regret it now should have taken the time to say this is wonderful and I hope this never ever ends but I know to face the sunrise and this is meaningful to be standing here with a friend when you're gone then I'll miss you in the moonlight I'll miss you in the moonlight I'll miss you in the moonlight won't you just stay here just a little bit longer, hey I knew this couldn't last forever But you know that I'm not ready Stay just a little bit longer, hey, hey. I really thought that we could have this always Stay just a little bit longer, hey I knew this couldn't last forever But you know that I'm not ready Stay just a little bit longer Hey, hey I really thought that we could have this Always Ooh.